God is definitely in the business of resurrecting and healing lives. That's what he does. That's what he does with all of us. At whatever age you are, whether you're in high school or whether you're in your middle years, he is in the business of resurrecting lives. I am incredibly familiar with many of the cemeteries that, that exist in this area. I've, I've done a lot of funerals. I, I know Maple Hill very, very well right here in Tip City. I was just recently at, at uh, Abbotsville over near Arcanum, that Abbotsville um, Cemetery and in Moat Cemetery. I have been there a number of times, which is just real near Franklin Moreau High School, Brookville. I've been to Vandalia, just northern Dayton, all, all around here, so many cemeteries. And, and I have made it a habit to just take some time. I just walk through the cemeteries, and I, I walk by places where I've been with families as they have pitched the tent and they are putting the casket in the ground, and, and, um, and I remember those moments. It might be months, it might be years ago, but I sit there in front of these tombstones, or stand there in front of these tombstones, and I think back to that moment where I was with that family. And I think back to memories of that with that person, various places that I've been or conversations I got in with them. And, and in those moments, I, I, I ask myself this question. As it takes me back to those reflective moments, I ask, what is most important in life? Because the fact is, they're still in that ground, and I'm still breathing. And, and so I ask myself, what's most important in the days or minutes or seconds that I have left on the clock? Am I doing what I should be doing? Have you ever asked yourself that? How much time do you have on the clock? And let me further this illustration. It was 1982. And... There, it was known as the big game. It was a game between California Golden Bears and the Stanford Cardinals. And it had, and it had been an exciting game. It had been a tight game. And, and Stanford had just scored to make it 20 to 19. And so they were going to kick off and, uh, to, the, to the California Golden Bears. Here was the problem. There was only four seconds left on the clock. It's, it's a squib kick. You tackle the guy. Game over. Stanford wins. What happens next, what happened next, will go down, has gone down in college football lore as the play. Take a look. Watch the little yellow arrow. Harmon will probably try to squib it, and he does. Ball comes loose, and the Bears have to get out of bounds. Rodgers along the sideline, another one. They're still in deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of... The ball is still loose as they get it to Rodgers. They give it back now to the 30. They're down to the 20. Oh, the band is out on the field. He's going to go into the end zone. He's going to the end zone. Will it count? <laughs> I, I saw this. Don't you love that? I saw this clip and I went, Happy Easter. <laughs> I have finally figured out how to use a sports clip on Easter Sunday. <laughs> I, I, the four seconds left on the clock, all you have to do is tackle him. And it couldn't do it. Four seconds. How much time is left on your clock? You don't know. Let me rewind. Let me rewind how we got here to Easter Sunday in Jesus' uh, life. 
Jesus in his final days was largely rejected by the religious leaders. They had rejected him, the authorities of, of the day. He was betrayed by a friend. I don't know if you've ever been betrayed by a friend, but Jesus in the last days was betrayed by a friend. All four Gospels record that. He was unjustly arrested. He was unfairly accused. All the Gospels record that. He was tortured and he was spat upon. Three of the Gospels record that. John leaves that part particularly out. He was mocked and he was ridiculed. All four Gospels. He was nailed to a cross and he died and he was buried in a tomb. Game over. No time left on the clock. It's done. In fact, the Bible says that the skies grew dark. And, and, I, and I have often thought about that. The skies grew dark and it was just reflecting the end of all hope. Just, we're done. I've been with so many families in those moments. The friends, they, they slowly go back to the car they get in the car and they go on to wherever the crowd is going to have some lunch and then they move on with their lives. The family is in such grief that they are wrapped up in this grief and that they, so much that they can hardly function. When the women approached the tomb that day, they were coming to simply finalized the preparations that they had started on Friday. On Friday, they were trying to, people were trying to finish up. Jesus had been taken from the cross. Sometimes the Romans would leave the, the bodies of the crucified on the, on the cross as a deterrent to anyone else who wanted to break any rules. But in this case, Joseph of Arimathea took the body. Nicodemus helped him. They got the preparation started. But they ran out of time at the end of Friday because the Sabbath started and they lost light and so they ended. And then Saturday was the Sabbath, so Sunday was the most logical time. They had the light, it was no longer the Sabbath, and they began. And as Tyler read the scriptures, here's what it said. After the Sabbath had dawned on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Now, before I go on, I want you to just picture this angel sitting on this rock, this tomb. He's probably just trimming his nails, waiting for the Marys to come. And he saw that they were there. And oftentimes we will read that kind of just the way I just read the first part of that. But what if we read it kind of like the commentator who, who just announced the last four seconds of the big game. That angel, the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. I know that you're looking for Jesus. He is he's been crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was, and then go quickly to the disciples. Tell them, that he is risen and he's going to go ahead of you to, to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. I've told you. I've told you he was going to rise. That's more like what the angel would have said had he been a Dan Glover angel. How about that? <laughs> Jesus walked across the goal line of life and death and he won. And today is the day we celebrate that. And here's the thing. Jesus did not just win for himself. He won 
for you and for me. Just like the last guy who had the ball in that clip. His name was Kevin Moen. And he went across the goal line. And Kevin did not just win for himself, did he? He won for that whole team. And he didn't just win for the whole team. Any, the entire school body. He won for the entire school body. And anyone who was a, a California Golden Bears fan, he won it for all of them. And in the same way, Jesus wins for us. And I love what that last scene, Kevin comes across. He's going through the, the band is out on the field. They are already celebrating the, the victory and and. And they didn't even realize they had lost the game. And when I saw that, I went, oh, that is Easter right now. And, 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 and as a final parting shot, as Kevin is crossing the line, he, he, he leveled a trombone player <laughs> right there who was probably licking his lips, ready to play the victory song, and, and to come find out they lost the game. That's what Jesus did for us. What does it mean that Jesus won? What did he win? Let me look at three victories that Jesus had at the resurrection. The first was this. Jesus defeated Satan. He defeated him. The Bible says that, there, that this, there is, we are no match for this enemy, the devil. In fact, in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says this, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What Peter is saying is we need to be vigilant. There is an enemy out there and we are no match for them. I know we make fun of that. I know I've made fun of that. I've, I've said, yeah. I can, I can handle that. I've had people come up to me and say, hey, I'm probably going to go to hell because that's where I know all the street names down there. And we make light of that. We are no match for this enemy. And Peter is calling us to be vigilant against this enemy because this enemy drags us into temptation. This enemy distorts the truth, deceives our minds, discourages our hearts, destroys our relationships, and diminishes our self-worth. Have you ever felt any of that? That's the enemy that Jesus took on at the cross and the resurrection. The attack is constant. And the Bible says in 1 John that it gives us this picture. It's not just the attack on you. It says that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. 1 John 5, 19. This is a worldwide problem that we cannot win against the devil by ourselves. Let me say that again. Somebody needs to hear that. You have been trying to do it on your own. You are independent to to the last degree. Anybody, do I get any hand raises on that? We were, not, we were designed to live with God, not to battle against Satan. We, that's, that's who we are. But Jesus beat this enemy. In fact, the final score of the game was written down before this, this ever took place. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it says this, So the Lord said to the serpent, this was right at the fall, and he's divvying out what he saw Adam and Eve do, and then he levels his focus on the serpent and says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. God is talking about his son there to the serpent, and telling him, This is how the game ends for you. You will strike him on his heel. You will nip his heel and you will try to take him out for a couple of plays. 
but he will come back and he will crush your head. That is as close to the almighty God going in the end zone and spiking the football as we have in Scripture. That is who he is. This is, even though the enemy knew the final score, Satan kept trying to tackle Jesus throughout his ministry. Satan started right at his birth. He moved in the heart of Herod and said at Jesus' birth, he said, go and kill all the, the newborn babies, two years old and younger, hoping to take Jesus out. It started right at his birth. He was a baby. Satan does not care. And Satan does not care about you or me at any stage of our life. He was in the he was he went with Jesus out into the desert to and and that was the place I've read that story over and over again and this is what I wished it had said. I remember thinking this is where Satan could have come and bowed down and said I was wrong. You are the name above all names. But Satan did not do that. Satan got alone with Jesus and tried to tempt him to follow and worship him. Satan tried to turn or turn the religious leaders' hearts away from Jesus during his ministry years. And then Satan took him to the cross, nailed him to that cross, and, and probably said to himself, I finally won. I got him out of the game. But at the cross and then into the tomb, Paul writes in Colossians years later, he says about Jesus, having disarmed the powers and authorities, that's what Jesus did. Disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them at the cross. That's what the cross means. That's what the resurrection had. It had, it was a, it was, it was a, it was two punches and you're out, Satan. And he beat him at his own game. That's how he defeated Satan. Secondly, he defeated sin. Sin is that spiritual force that we all face every day of our lives. The Bible speaks about the fact that we are born into sin. We are born into sin, and we have all faced addictions. We've all faced strongholds in our life, failures and weaknesses and disappointment and brokenness. All of us have, because the, the battle is constant, that sin, and, and that sin causes us and makes us feel ashamed and guilty. And we don't feel like approaching God. In fact, sin creates a barrier between us and God. It just, it's, it's like God is not even there. And so, so the sin problem is our problem. It's everyone's problem. The Bible says that the wages of that sin is death. And for the Bible, death is not annihilation. I shared this a couple of weeks ago. It's not, death is not like you're gone, you're disintegrated, you're, you're, um, you're done for, you're decayed. That's not what the Bible is talking about. Death for the Bible is separation from God. This life affords us glimpses of the goodness of God. We see it. We, to, today you will spend time maybe with your family or you've had glimpses of the goodness of God. But there's going to come a time where the lights are going to go out for you and for me. And, if we, and for those who have not declared whose side we are on, when all of this goes away and if you are among those who have, are found without the sacrifice of Christ over you, there will be no one to pay your debt. No one. This is how Paul writes about it again in Colossians. He says this, 
when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it all away, nailing it to the cross. That's how Paul puts it in Colossians 2. So the cross frees us from the penalty of sin, and the resurrection frees us from the power of sin. When you surrender to Jesus Christ, when you actually say, no longer my way, but your way, Lord. It's your way in my life. When you surrender to Jesus Christ, that same power that awakened him in the tomb that day is now available and living in you. That's how it works. So Jesus Christ defeated Satan, and he now defeats sin on this day. Finally, the third victory that Jesus secured through the cross and the resurrection was Jesus defeated death. One writer wrote about death this way, and you may have thought about, if you've thought about death, you may have thought about it this way. He wrote, death is the ultimate enemy because it takes everything from us. Think of all the things that we strive to preserve and keep from losing, and death steals them all. Sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, the capacity to communicate, to enjoy any kind of pleasure, all gone. The ability to move around and control our comings and our goings, the ability to influence others, family and friends, gone. Our possessions are divided up and given away. Our friends and loved ones abandon us and find other companions, and we are put in a box and buried in the ground. Death is not a friend. Death is an enemy. I've been around enough death in my life, watching families struggle through the aftermath when death takes its toll. And it is why, it's why we, none of us are looking for the fountain of old, right? Anybody looking for the fountain of old? We're all looking for the fountain of youth. But when Jesus sat up in that tomb and evacuated death's chamber, he changed everything. While death feels like the end of life, Jesus' resurrection is showing us that death is actually the beginning of something far better. And his message is that he is inviting us to come join him there. What if you began, what if you began to consider death as not lights out, but lights on? What if you began to consider that? Just think about that. Wouldn't you ask yourself, where do I go to find out more about that? In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes this about that resurrection moment and says, death has been swallowed up in victory. There are people who believe this. There, are, there is a man who lived this and people who wrote about this and there's people today who believe that. They may be sitting right next to you. They may have taken the opportunity to ask you to come today. And they were taking a big risk because they didn't know what I'd be talking about or what you would be hearing. And they are praying for you right now that you would hear this message, that, that somehow it would get through. And when you actually begin to see what Scripture is saying, you begin to realize that death is not about grief. Death actually is about great gain. And that can only make sense 
if you realize that God did not make you for this world. He did not. There is more than just this world. That this life is just a moment. And that there is an eternity that Jesus came to tell us about and to do everything necessary to help us step into it. But we have to step into it. In fact, Jesus at a funeral said to a woman at the funeral, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. You may say, now wait a minute, Dan. I've known a lot of people who confess Jesus and they're dead. They died. That's because Jesus was not talking about physical death here. He was talking about what will happen the moment after your heart stops beating on this planet. Death in the Bible is separation from God. And Jesus was saying, you may die on this planet, but you will never be separated from God. You will move from this earthly life to this spiritual life and you will be with God forever. It is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote this about death. Bonhoeffer was a believer. And it will sound a little different than what the other author I wrote, uh, read earlier. Bonhoeffer wrote, death is the greatest gift that God gives to people who believe in him. Death is mild. Death is sweet. Death is gentle. It beckons us with heavenly power. If only we realize that it is the gateway to our homeland. It is the tabernacle of our joy. It is the everlasting kingdom of our peace. All of us are going to die. It's coming. And when you look down the road at that moment, what do you see? What do you see? Do you see it as lights out, gone, done? Or can you imagine with me it as a gateway to your new homeland. We get there through believing in this man, Jesus, who rose from the grave. It is truly the only real hope on earth. And I'd love to get into a conversation with you. You show me where the other hopes are on this planet. You don't need another sermon today. I, I realize that. So I'm on the clock. <laughs> what you need is a Savior. This Easter morning, there's still time on the clock for you. For one more play. One more. One more play. Perhaps your whole life has brought you to this moment right now. He saved you. He saved your physical life for this spiritual moment. The devil on your back that you have been trying to beat your whole life needs defeated. The sin, great and small, that has entangled you forever, it needs defeated in your life. The death that you have had brushes with, but you've only feared from a distance, it needs defeated in your life. You need an understanding in your heart of what's going to happen that moment after you leave this earth. All of it can be set down at the opening of an empty tomb and ask yourself, what really is most important? What is most important? This day can be your personal resurrection day. And all that needs to happen is for you to say what your heart has been in conflict about maybe for years and years, maybe your whole life. Yes to Jesus Christ. 
Would you bow in prayer with me? And I want to declare an altar right in front, right at the back of each of these chairs. So as you look at the back side of the chair in front of you, and you kneel or bow your head, I want you to just consider that kind of an altar right now. And if this prayer reflects the attitude of your heart, just kind of listen to it and let it, let it be your prayer. Heavenly Father, maybe for the first time, Lord, I, I actually heard that the message is for me. That this whole preaching thing and the Bible and Christians and church For some reason, it just makes sense today. And I know, Lord, that this moment is for me. You carved it out. You carved it out of time so that you and I could do business. And I know that my part is to say right here and right now to you, Lord, personally, I, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. And Father, I, I'm beginning to recognize that Jesus was sent not just for humanity, but Jesus was sent for me. And I accept today his sacrifice made on the cross and delivered to me out of the tomb on Easter Sunday was for me. And I received that. Today is the day. There's still time on the clock, Lord. And you show me what you want me to do. In Jesus' holy name, I pray. Amen.